Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Shakespeare from his Starry Games. This is a Euro game where you and the other players are, I think, theater or production managers, something like that, back in the time of Shakespeare. And you are trying to utilize Shakespeare and his theater company to your best effect. You have to bring in actors, you have to pay them, hopefully by the end of the game, or else you're going to lose a lot of points. Give them the best costumes that you possibly can, have the best set dressings that you possibly can, and make sure that the writing is up to snuff on all of the different acts of your play. Let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played, then we're going to come back, I'll let you know what I think. Alright, let me run you through a quick overview of Shakespeare. This is a competitive game for one to four players. Now, I have played this with two, three, and four players, but I have not played it with one player. I have not played the solo mode so I can't comment on that, but let me show you how it would work with a four-player setup. Now, the goal of the game, I mentioned in my intro that the theme is that you are theater companies trying to utilize Shakespeare and his actors and stagehands to their best benefit. In this case, you have six days until showtime. You have this little round tracker up here. Uh, you want to have the most victory points, which are, is this is the track right here that you keep track of. Everyone starts off at five victory points. Um, you want to have the most victory points by the end of six days. You will notice that there are shaded out spots on the board for rounds four and round six or days four and six that is dress rehearsal those have special effects which we'll get back to in a minute but otherwise you're just going to be moving through the rounds getting to the end seeing who has the most points now let me run you through the setup uh, we'll start from here since we're already focused on this you have set pieces and you have costume pieces you're going to have a certain amount of these out on the board depending on the number of players it's actually written on the spaces. Uh, you'll draw them randomly from these black bags um, and you'll actually only have a certain amount of them in circulation depending on the number of players. Uh, but the square ones are the set pieces, the round ones are the costume pieces. Uh, the numbers are significant for um, all of the pieces but even more so for the costume pieces um, especially the gold pieces here are significant for both of them uh, because those cannot be gained through normal means. I'll explain all of that but it's also worth noting that the set pieces um, everything except for the ones which have an X on the back of them all but the ones actually have special abilities which won't make sense now so I'm not going to totally explain them. Underneath all of that you have the different act tracks which uh, so what I call them which is really hard to say three times fast, act tracks, act tracks, act tracks, but <laughs> there's a couple of different things of note here. First, you have the turn order track, which at the beginning of the game is going to be randomized, but in future rounds is going to be dependent upon a bidding system where you bid for your actions each turn. Again, I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Then you have the initiative track. The initiative track is going to be very important for things like breaking ties, but uh, it, that's going to be determined by who is taking uh, the actions of actors first every round, and then you'll lock into place. Uh, then you have the different acts of the the play, you uh, representing the writing and how well they are uh, actually written out and uh, by the playwrights, by Shakespeare himself and his other writers, presumably. Uh, and these all represent the different acts one, two, and three, and everyone's got a marker on one of these, and you're gonna be moving up these tracks during the course of the game by taking special actions. Now, I'll go ahead and explain this now. If, um, the only time that you are actually going to score these is during the dress rehearsals, during rounds four, at the end of round four, and at the end of round six, or day four and day six. If you are still stuck below space four on each of these tracks, you're actually going to lose a victory point. That's why it has that burnt out candle there. But if you get to certain other points on the track, not only will you not lose victory points, you'll actually gain something. So on the top track, if you get to this spot, you'll actually gain a, co a pound. If you get to this spot, you'll gain three pounds. If you get to this spot, you'll gain five pounds. Uh, you'll, you won't get a, the cumulative total of all of those, but whichever milestone you've been able to reach, you'll get whatever you have passed or landed on. For the yellow track, it's actually a race. Whoever is uh, in the lead on this track is going to get two victory points. Whoever is in second place is going to get one victory point. Whoever's in third or fourth gets nothing. Um, the way that this works with the markers is whoever is 
gets to a spot first is there first. So if your marker lands on top of someone else's, you're still behind them. And then on the last track, it's simply, if you get to certain milestones, you're going to get either one, two, or three victory points. Again, these are only scored during the two dress rehearsals of the game. Over here to the side, you are going to have the character deck and the character cards. These are going to be randomly determined by the number of players. So I believe it's a, it's number of players plus two. So in this case, we have four players plus two cards. So you're going to have six of them out on the table. And then the rest are going to be face down. Although it is it, worth noting that the face down cards, which would be what looks like a guard there, that is the, uh, the extras, they are called extra cards. They are a character that you can take by taking one of these cards and taking it face down instead of for its face up value. Now at the beginning of the game, you and the other players are actually going to uh, put out a random assortment of characters and then draft them one by one in turn order, then replenish and then start the game. So you are going to front load each of yourselves with one character before you even start. Other things of note, you have the objective deck, which is very specifically attached to one character special action. You'll just shuffle that up. You have these little tokens, which represent a plus three bonus to the craftspeople that you use. And then every player is going to get four of these uh, rest tokens, or what the, these are called. Uh, whenever you've used characters, you're going to have to put rest tokens on them, perhaps. I'll get to all that. And then you're going to have the two bags of the different set tokens and costume pieces. Uh, you also have a huge pile of money. Money is going to be important during the course of the game, but not really until the... It's, it's going to be important to gain it during the course of the game, but not until the end of the game will it really matter. And then you'll have a cheat sheet card, which will tell you the dispensation, depending on the number of players, of tokens in the game, and also reminds you what their special effects are. And this is a recruitment card. When you recruit a character from the lineup, you'll replace it with this card to show that you have done your one recruitment for the rounds. Every player is also going to have the same player board. Uh, very, uh, there are a lot of different things of note on this board. First and foremost, there are four actors, uh, or I should say three actors, and or two actors and a, two production people who are on every player's board. They are built in, you always have access to them, and you do not have to pay for them. They do not have coins in the upper corner. Uh, so we'll get to all of them in a minute. And then you have your set. This is the set of your theater that you're going to be building up. This is where you're going to be putting those tokens uh, during the course of the game. You have your ambiance track here, which keeps track of how well your theater's presentation is doing. Uh, you have a reminder for the, uh, the costume bonuses. And then these are your action markers. You're going to get five of these cylinders. And then off to the side somewhere, you're going to be putting the actors in stage hands that you're going to be gaining during the course of the game. All right, the easiest way to explain the game is just to run you through how a typical round and uh, the, and your turns are going to work. First things first, at the start of a round, each player is going to take all of their act. These are the action cylinders. These are what are going to let you activate the different actors and stage hands under your control. At the beginning of each round, you're going to take all of those into hand, and you are going to secretly put a certain number of them in hand, representing the amount of actions you're going to be eligible to take for the rounds. When everyone is selected, you will reveal. Now, the reason why you might want to take less than the maximum amount of actions, although it is perfectly fine if you do that, you will not be penalized necessarily for taking the maximum amount of actions, but if you were to take less actions, you would be in the running to become eligible to be first for the round. Whoever takes the least amount of actions is therefore acting faster and has uh, more free time, I guess, to do things and be more flexible, and therefore they're going to go first, and then you'll figure out who has the second most amount of actions, and ties are going to be broken by the initiative track. Also, whoever comes in first place is going to get a bonus victory point as indicated by the player board. So sometimes it's going to be very important to make sure that you come in first and therefore you'll take less actions. Whatever action this you did not bid, you put off to the side and there are your actions. You'll put them in the space and then you're going to be out, they're going to be available to use. Next comes the meat of the game and this is your activations. And you have two different things that you can do. Once per round, you may recruit. This is where I mentioned before, you're going to take your recruitment card and you're going to take one of the face-up characters and then put this card in its place. Then you'll put that actor amongst all of the other actors under your control. Somewhere off to the side of the board, doesn't really matter, as long as people know that it's yours. Now at this point, let me go ahead and show you some of these actor cards so you know what I'm talking about. Um, First off, up in the top corner, and this is very important, you have the cost to hire that actor and to keep them
them employed. You do not have to pay this until the end of the game, but it's very important that you do pay it at the end of the game, because if you don't, you lose two victory points at the end. So you need to be accumulating money during the course of the game. That is, in fact, the only thing that money is for other than a tiebreaker for winner of the game. Up in the opposite corner is the action that this character is going to grant you when you put your action disc on them and activate them. Now, what this is, is a white feather. That's actually a wild feather representing that you can move up one on any of the tracks. If I were to activate that character, I'd get to move up the yellow track. I can move up the red track, whatever I wanted to do, but otherwise it might be specifically colored in some cases. At the bottom of only the actor cards, you're gonna have these three circles representing spaces for costumes. The costumes are gonna do a couple of different things. First off, if you fill up the entire track with the uh, little costume tokens, uh, which look like this, then you calculate the number of points there are based on the numbers that are on the tokens from one to five and see where you fall on this track. You do this right away. So if you were to get a total of 11 to 12, you'd get two victory points. But if you add more than that, the, like up to the maximum, you'd get three victory points. If you have the least amount possible, you, uh, you would get two uh, coins instead. So uh, definitely something to uh, consider as you're putting tokens down. You want to fill up the track, but you also want to have the most value that you possibly can. The other thing that's here is a special action. This only happens if your costumes are all filled up and if it is dress rehearsal. When that happens, you'll gain a special ability, which in this case is that you get to move up one on all three tracks. Uh, here's another actor. You see that his special ability for the costumes is only to go up one on the yellow track, but his special ability when you just activate him by putting an action marker on him, you can move up one on any of the tracks and you get up to three value worth of sets. Uh, or I'm sorry, you take a, th a set piece worth three. That's what you get to take uh, with his special ability. Hers is even more specific. You get to take a costume, notice that it's a circle, that is green. You get to take one of the green five costumes and then put it, every time that you take a costume, it must go down onto one of your actors. Uh, King Lear here gets to take the, uh, the blue number four set piece when you place them down and you get to move up one on one of the tracks. And notice that their set dress rehearsal abilities change as well. Now here are the, uh, the I think they're craftsmen is what their proper term is, the collective term. Uh, this one is for the sets. You notice that there's no costumes or anything like this. There's just this icon indicating that they're a craftsman, though they still need to get paid just like the actors at the end of the game. That's a three coin. Uh, this guy lets you take up to six worth of set pieces in any combination that you can, but only up to six. This is the costume designer. She lets you take eight worth of the um, costume pieces. I should mention that she's available. So there's a six version of her, an eight version of her. Same thing with the uh, the set person, the six and an eight version. Now this is an assistant. He can't do anything on his own, but he increases the value of your costume and set people by one. And those bonuses would stack if you get a lot of him. And then this is the jeweler. Now this is the exception to the rule with the craftsman. You cannot take the golden yellow pieces with the normal craftsman. Those can only be taken with the jeweler. When you activate them, you take one or the other, and those will get put onto your board as normal, except that the gold pieces are gonna be worth a bonus victory point for each one you have at the end of the game. So that can be super powerful. Now let's talk about the set, since I was just talking about that a little bit. When you put the set pieces out, a couple of rules need to be followed. First off, it must be symmetrical. If I put a two here, this must be a two. Now, since there's only, since it's an uneven number here, there's five, I could put anything I want in the center, assuming I was allowed to take that gold piece with the jeweler. But then if I put a four here, a four would have to go here. Now, I don't have to build all the way out like that at the bottom, but I need to make my structure going up with a foundation. Meaning, let's say that I started off by putting the two here. I could not just leave a dangling four up here, but had I put a four down here already, I could put this three here, and these are like free spaces. They don't really count for anything. So if I put another one here, that's perfectly fine. And in fact, when you cover up any of these candle spaces, you immediately get a bonus victory point. Now underneath that is the ambiance track. 
And this is going to move up or down depending on whether or not you gain special actions that let it move up and down. Like, for instance, the inherent character here, his special ability is to move you two on, when you activate and move you two up on the ambience track. And at the end of the rounds, one of the first things you do is check to see which bonus you get. Whether it's a coin or a fe uh, going up one on one of the tracks or a victory point. Or if you were forced to go down on the track, you might lose a victory point or have to go down one on one of the tracks. You might be forced to go down on the track if at the end of the round there are any of the purple set pieces in the stock remaining. For each one that's there, every player has to go down. Or one of the special abilities of the set pieces is that if someone takes it, everyone else that's not that player has to go down on the uh, ambiance track. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I almost forgot this. Let me go ahead and explain what the special powers of all the pieces are. That's dumb of me, I should have remembered that. The one does nothing. However, the gold piece, in addition to being worth a point at the end of the game, is a wild. So the, the gold piece can actually be symmetrical with anything. That's a special ability, aside from being worth a point. Uh, the number four piece of blue piece actually gets you two ambiance when you put it down into your set. The number two gets you a coin. That's what its special power is. And then I think the only one that I haven't covered is the five, the green, which is actually going to give you one of these plus three markers. These will increase the value of your craftsman by three when you have to use them to get costume pieces or set pieces. And just to finish up what's on your player board, you have William Shakespeare here who can be activated to give you move you up two on one track or one on two different tracks. You have this guy who can get you a mixture of uh, set pieces and costume pieces to a total value of four. And then you have the queen who gives you two different actions. You have to choose one of them when you utilize her. Either you get $4 right off the bat, you just add it to your stock, or you get to draw three of the objective cards, choose the one you like, discard the other two, we just put them on the bottom of the deck, and hold on to that in secret till the end of the game and possibly score it. Let me show you some examples of all of the objective cards. Uh, you have this card here which says that at the end of the game, if you discard two pennies, two dollars, uh, you get a victory point. If you discard five, you get two victory points. This one has to do with the sets. If the total value of your set is 26 points, you get a victory point. If you get 40 points worth of set pieces, you get two victory points. This one lets you dismiss an actor. That's what it does, which could save you money and therefore save you victory points potentially as well. This one, there's a version of this for actors as well, but essentially if you have three craftsmen under your control, you get one victory point. If you have at least four, you get two victory points. And there's a lot more, but you get the idea. Once every player has done all of their actions, and because people bid different amounts, then you may pass before the other players have a chance, and you can pass at any time if you want to, if you don't want to take all of your actions. Then you finish up. First you do the ambiance track, which I already explained. Then on days four and six only, you would have the dress rehearsal. The first thing you do in the dress rehearsal, in the order of the initiative track, is activate the costumes of your actors, which means use your special power if, of the actors if you have filled up their tracks. Uh, and then you score each of the different acts, as I explained before, if you have moved up on those tracks. But that's only on days four and six, rounds four and six. But then on every round, you're gonna do maintenance, which is just putting out brand new character cards. You'll discard any that are still left there. Put out brand new ones. If you have to reshuffle, you'll reshuffle. Put uh, Get rid of any costume and um, set piece elements that are still there and put new ones out from the bag. And then move the round marker forward. Then you go to resting, and this is the other important part of the game. So, like I said, you're gonna be using your action markers to mark off the different people that you use. So let's say, in my example, I had three action markers. I decided to use Shakespeare and the Queen. I don't know why that's there. And I used this actor over here. Uh, so now, I'm gonna take a number of rest tokens from my stock of four equal to the number of action markers I've used minus one meaning I must put two rest tokens out on two of those people at least. Let's say I don't really want to use the queen next time, so I'll use her. And I don't really want to use uh, this woman either, so I'll go ahead and put the rest token on her. Then I get rid of all my action markers. They go back into my stock. And now William is going to be able to be used again next round, but the other two are not. So essentially, every person that you use in a round is going to have to rest for the next round except for one. 
and that is the game. You're going to keep taking actions like that um, until the end of round six. You'll have your final dress rehearsal. Then you're going to score points wherever you are on the track, plus wherever you are for the acts because you're doing the final dress rehearsal. Minus two for every actor you are not able to pay at the end, as well as plus one for any gold elements you have out in your sets and your costumes. That's a quick and dirty run, well not too quick, but a dirty run through of Shakespeare. Let's get to my final thoughts. Well, the components and the presentation of Shakespeare are solid. I mean, I love the artwork. The artwork is fantastic in this game. Uh, most of the physical bits are fine. I mean, it's cylinders and discs, which is, eh, I don't really know what thematic thing they could have used instead of it. I mean, it is a Euro game. You're just going to have that kind of stuff. I do wish that the tokens for the costumes were a bit bigger, and uh, the scoring track is the dreaded snaking track, which is annoying. People, I mean, I'm kind of used to it by this point, unfortunately, but other people I've played with were like, ah, come on, come on, come on. I mean, they're constantly moving their bits and uh, their discs in the wrong direction. Um, and I don't really see the point of the recruitment card for the characters either, but that's a minor complaint. Overall, I mean, when you finish the game, especially like in a four-player game, and everyone's got their board and all of the set dressings are on and you've got all your character cards laid out it's a pretty impressive looking game um if for what is essentially i don't want to say it's a light euro game it's definitely got a lot of complexity to it as far as um the decision making process and all these different things but it's not like a huge sprawling epic euro game by any stretch of the imagination so the fact that it can actually look really good and it can actually give the appearance that it's an epic game by the time you're done that says something about the presentation of it so i would say a plus in that regard uh then we move on to the theme and i'm not going to say it's the most thematic game ever but I am going to say that by Eurogame standards, it's way more thematic than you could probably have hoped for. At a point, you do feel like you're just shuffling around discs and tokens, but also it does make sense. I mean, you're putting costumes on your actors. You have to make sure that your set looks good in order to maximize the uh, amount of patrons that you're going to get there. If that's what, you know, you're trying to attract people into your theater and make it a good presentation for them within the confines of the story of the game. And by making it symmetrical, I guess it makes kind of sense. Although I don't think every single uh, playhouse in history has made things perfectly symmetrical as far as colors. Um, but And also having to pay your actors and making sure all the different acts of the play are well written. These are little thematic bits that, again, could kind of come out of the wash when you're just moving tokens around and scoring points. But I appreciate the effort that they put into that. It doesn't feel like a pace it on theme it feels like they actually had some intent to have this theme when they were developing the game at least that's my impression and i do appreciate that effort that they put into it as far as the gameplay goes this is super interesting first off the whole concept of uh, how the actors and stage hands of the production crew uh there's so many different names i was using for them as we were playing how that whole concept works of how you have to pay them by the end of the game you have to, but you don't have to pay until the end of the game, which means that either, you know any good Euro game re um, rewards forward thinking, strategic planning. But also, you look at these characters, and they have awesome abilities. You're like, wow, I, I really need to move up these tracks in a hurry, and if I grab that girl right now, she's going to give me... Uh, if, if I load her up with costumes, I get to move up a bunch of extra free spaces on like all three different tracks potentially. And so you look at these awesome abilities and the assistance and all these different things and you're like, well, I could probably afford to pay all these people by the end. Let me just worry about that at the end. But it is super critical. And I've played games of this where everyone was uh, had a couple of actors that were unpaid. And I've played games of it where just by the skin of our teeth, we were able to pay for all of our actors. And it is super critical. Two points in this game, a huge swing. That's the thing about Shakespeare is that there is very little room for error here. This is a tight game. The highest scoring game I've seen, I think, was between like 24 to 26, which might sound like a lot, but this is a full-length game, and there's just not a ton of opportunities for you to score points. A good round for you, let's see, with six rounds of play, uh, a good round for you might just be scoring like four points, uh, which is a lot in this game. And you have to make those kind of critical decisions uh, to the point where if you can't pay for one person, that could be life or death for you. Taking one extra action, life or death. I've had that happen to me before. One of the games that I was in, I'm not sure I would have come in first place. I came in last. But I, I might have at least been able to come in second place if there was one round where I did not take an action disc and uh, bid with an action cylinder. 
that I didn't have to. <laughs> By the time we got to my end of uh, the rounds or the end of uh, my round of actions, I was like, oh, I have an action that I don't need. And if I hadn't taken that, I would have come in uh, first place in the bidding, which means I would have gotten an extra point. And also, this uh, it's just there's so critical. I, you know, there's just not a lot of margin for error here. And, and in some games, I don't like that. But I really appreciated it here in Shakespeare. It just felt like a very good, just smooth game. Like everything was just working in this game. Uh, the whole race on all of the different act tracks, which is hard to say, uh, where uh, you have you can get extra points, you can get extra money, and those things become critically important. In one game that I played, the only way that I was able to pay all of my actors was by getting to the top of the money track, which is, I think, Act 1, at, at, right at the end of the game. And that got me the extra five bucks I needed because I'd already used the queen and her uh, power to get more money. That's another thing about the game. It's not just enough to take these actors and hopefully have enough to pay for them. The whole system of how you can, with the worker placement, essentially, the, the mechanism, you can utilize different actors, but then they need to rest. All but one of them needs to rest. This game can be prone to a little bit of analysis paralysis because of decisions like that, where you're like, okay, I need all of these people next round, but I'm only going to be able to save one of them because I used all of them now. And you're looking at the board, seeing what costumes are available, seeing what set pieces are available, and I really need the costume dresser, but I really need the set dresser. And uh, I could go for this, uh, the guy that's on my board who only gives me four, a total of four, but, and that's where things like the assistant come into play, and that's huge. And there's also the jeweler who can be a huge point swing. If you can corner the market on the gold pieces, that can be your focus for the game, and you'll do very well. And that's part of the, what I found interesting about the game as well, is that it's not that there's a ton of different options, but there's enough options here that someone can focus on a particular thing, like focusing on the tracks, you know, win the race. Uh, I think it's the yellow track where it's a race to see who, who gets first place or second place to get points. You can focus on those types of things. You can focus on your set dressings. That's what I did in one game, and I did pretty well. I didn't win, but one of the games that we played, just to give you an idea of how tight it was, we were all within one point of each other. It was like 23, 22, 21 points, and of course I was in 21. Uh, but in that game... I focused on set dressings, and I did very, very well. I could have done better, and maybe if I diversified a tiny bit, but by focusing on that and cornering that market, I did pretty well. And then you have the objective cards. Now, the objective cards are a crapshoot. There's not too many of them, and you do get to draw three and choose one, but there are times you will do it, and you're not going to get anything that great. And the points that you get are only one or two points for, I think, all of the cards, which means that... It's, it is points, and it's good, but it's almost like a last resort thing. It's almost like, okay, I'm focusing on these different aspects of the game, whether it's the tracks or whether it's uh, getting the golden set pieces and costumes or getting just costumes, as many, as many actors as I can. Um, but I'm okay with those, so let me go for an objective and see what that can do for me. That's almost where I think the objectives are in this game, and maybe I wish that they were a little more present in the game. Maybe if there was an overarching objective that every player had to give you a little more focus, but that might be a bit beyond the spectrum of what this game was going for. I think what this game wants you to do is be right down in the thick of it, just efficiency, being as efficient as possible, just finding out the absolute best way to use your actions. The bidding in this game is so stressful. I don't typically like bidding in games. I think it's handled okay here, just because it is so interesting. At the beginning of the game, people are going to be like, whatever, and everyone will just show five discs. Get to about mid-game, then it's like, you're looking at everyone, looking at what actions they have available to them, you're double-checking and double-checking and triple-checking your actions, like, what can I get away with not taking this turn, knowing that if I don't take my full complement of actions now, is that going to hurt me in the long run? Is it so worth it to me to get first place now just to take an action quicker, looking at the characters on the board, getting wondering about that extra points you get for coming in first place, which is critical. One point can be a huge difference in this game. Maybe not one point, but two points. You know, that type of thing. So, and again, this is over... 
I would say that that's a thematic element as well. This whole everything I've been talking about here, because it is the stresses of trying to get a production up and running. Even in modern day, I'm sure it's the same when a play is trying to get off the ground and meet opening night, you know, the dress rehearsals, just the stress of that, knowing that those benchmarks are coming up and you have to try to meet those to maximize your profits, to maximize the things that you're bringing in. I really enjoyed this game. I really do. In the same way that I like some of Stefan Feld's games, even though they should not be in my wheelhouse because of how dry they are, because of the Euro game mechanisms, the cleverness of the mechanisms and how they work and how tight everything is and how stressful it can be, but in a good way, those are the kind of feelings I get from Shakespeare and I really, really enjoyed my time with it. Definitely my type of Euro game, which is one of my favorite sayings since people don't typically attribute those types of games to me. But this one is a winner. As soon as it's available, check it out. If these are typically your type of game at all, you're not going to be disappointed. And it looks fantastic. That is Shakespeare from Astari Games. Highly recommended. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.